Hello, everyone. Ah, great. Um, thank you for being here today, and thank you to Sacking Sat for organizing the, uh, the panel and the conference. Um, my name is Joe with Cointelegraph, but for the purpose of this discussion today, consider me Joe from Bitcoin Telegraph, as of course we're going to cover Bitcoin and Bitcoin only. Um, I'm here and I'm really looking forward to talking to the three panelists today. Um, before we dive into the questions, I'd like you to introduce yourselves and explain to me where you come from, the rate of inflation where you come from, and if the currency you use now was the currency that was around when you were born. For example, I know it's three things, it's a lot to take into account on a Friday afternoon. Um, I'm Joe, I'm from the UK. The rate of inflation in the UK is 10.8%, double digits for the first time in 40 years, and uh, the pound was in use when I was born. Um, do we have enough mics as well? Yeah, we're good. Okay. Check, check, there we go. Uh, so my name is Ben, also known as BTC Sessions. I am from Calgary, Canada. Uh, the rate of inflation there is, uh, I didn't see the most recent, but somewhere in and around eight and 9%, something like that. Um, highest in 40 years. It is the same currency that, uh, that uh, since I've been living there, so okay. yeah. Hello, my name is Carol, I'm from Brazil. Right now, the rate of inflation is around 10.7%. And when I was born, it was cruzado, cruzeiro. Uh, Brazil already had a lot of currencies. Mm -hmm. And I have a lot of memories when I was trying to buy candies when I was a kid. And I couldn't because the money couldn't buy the things I wanted. And so inflation is something uh, really inside the lives of the Brazilians. And let's talk about this. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Ernesto from El Salvador. When I was born, we were using Colón, and then we passed through to the dollar. And the inflation rate is in between 8 to 12%. <laughs> great. And now, just, just to check, what currency do you use in El Salvador, sorry? Bitcoin. <laughs> got it. Got it. Okay, great. So we've got a really good spread yeah. here. You know, El Salvador, Brazil, Canada, and the UK. Um, I wanted to look back on the past year first and just think of any examples in your own countries, perhaps, where Bitcoin's case for being censorship-resistant money um, has enabled people to live you know, outside of the banking system or to circumvent some of the banking system's uh, victimization, if I can say that. Um, do you want to kick off yeah. then? Or? Uh, sure. So, I mean, I'm, I'm in a pretty privileged Western nation. Um, and so up until this year, uh, most of the use case for Bitcoin in and around people that I would know day to day would just be um, maybe a long term store value, but uh, most Canadians would have seen it as a speculative tool. Uh, however, uh, in February, we had the largest protest in Canadian history. Um, some of you may have seen some coverage of it. Uh, there was the, the trucker convoy. And basically those individuals, um, if they opted not to get vaccinated, uh, they effectively lost their jobs. Um, same with any government worker would lose their jobs as well. Uh, a lot of different sectors. Um, they also were not allowed to board a plane, train, boat, any type of uh, international or domestic travel. You could not fly within your own country. Um, and because our only land border is with the US, if you had lost your job and uh, you did not want to be vaccinated, you could not even leave if you did not like that rule. Uh, so in, uh, they started raising money for this protest. Um, GoFundMe was shut down and the funds were seized. And this was dollars, right? Yes, yes, and this was in dollars. Uh, there was another platform, Give, Send, Go, that said they were not going to stop the money raised. Uh, but as soon as they went to withdraw that money to a Canadian bank, that was shut down. Uh, and then, on top of that, the government, rather than kind of discussing with the protesters, uh, they opted to enable something called the uh, Emergencies Act, which is a form of martial law that basically gave them the rights to do whatever the hell they wanted. Uh, and they used that to shut down the bank accounts of anybody that was helping organize the protest, um, or in some cases, people who just donated to the protest. Uh, and so I set up the page that enabled them to receive Bitcoin donations. 
and uh, we received in this time span of about two weeks, we received over a million dollars. Um, and most of that was able to be delivered uh, directly to individuals that were protesting in Ottawa. Um, some of the coverage said Bitcoin got frozen. It was requested to be frozen. What happened but, next? <laughs> but it, uh, most of it ended up in the hands of individual truckers near the end um there was a about 20 to 30 percent uh that got stuck in a wallet momentarily and unfortunately in that period of time uh, one of the organizers of the convoy had their home raided all of their electronics taken and so some of that is currently sitting in illegal escrow but the use case for bitcoin was in the face of what was previously a legal protest mm -hmm. deemed illegal after the fact um none of the donations that were done in fiat dollars got to their intended recipients. But Bitcoin, even with some missteps along the way, was the only source of funding that actually got where it was intended. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And is that Emergencies Act still in place? Uh, no, it, it would have been. Okay. Uh, the parliament voted and uh, Justin Trudeau basically uh, buddied up with another political party and said that if they didn't vote yes, he would call another election. So everybody who was voting on it didn't want to lose their seats. Right. Uh, and so they all voted yes, and mm -hmm. so he had a majority there. Uh, but then when it got to the Senate, who there was no threat of an impending election for them, mm -hmm. they asked for the evidence that this act was needed. Mm -hmm. And it was pretty clear that they were going to require some actual evidence. And uh, the next day, Trudeau... Uh, stopped the act. Okay, okay. Yeah. Wow. And this is in, you know, developed country. Yeah, yeah. I was pretty astounded to see this happen. Yeah. Um, I mean, sorry, would you like to, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I, I was oh. handing it. I oh, okay, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, yeah, it's tricky when there's um, the one mic. Um, yeah. uh, Carol, I was actually interested in how a person's nationality sort of shapes their acceptance or their readiness to understand and run with Bitcoin. You know, in, in the UK where I'm from or in France, you know, it, it, sometimes it's quite a hard sell. And, you know, you mentioned that when you were born, there was a different currency. Brazil's gone through several currencies in the past 100 years. Um, I don't actually know how many, but I'm sure you'll tell us. Um, does being Brazilian, are Brazilians more ready to accept and understand and learn about Bitcoin? I think yes. Uh, I will do an um, overview about the uh, history of Brazil and the politics of money and um, we already had nine currencies. Now it's the ninth. And Lucky number nine. Whoa. But it's the same film. The mm -hmm. currency is devaluating. And um, from the 50s till the uh, 90s, we had like 19 quadrillion percent inflation. And they just cut at zeros. They do uh, a new kind of note. They uh, cut zeros from the notes, do a rebranding and change the name. We had Cruzado, Cruzado Novo, Cruzado Real, a lot of currencies, different names, but the same film. Until around um, 91, when Real was created, the currency that is currently used in Brazil. But in the last 27 years, Real already devaluated 86%. So the same film. And before that, the president Collor, mm -hmm. he confiscated the savings accounts of Brazilians because he wanted to uh, control the crisis, control inflation, but stealing money. Until now, some of those uh, Brazilians that had their savings accounts confiscated never get back the money. And now it's like um, a deja vu because Brazil is creating a, a CBDC called Real Digital that is going to have a, a blocking system. If the, there's any bank runs, they can avoid people to withdraw their money from the banks. It's like a built-in censorship tool. Perfect, that's it. So when money fails, that's when we see censorship, confiscation, and everything that's bad. So it takes time to fail sometimes. And Brazil had a lot of examples of how money fails, how it affects the population, and Bitcoin is the perfect tool to get back empowering people, empowering the population. And I can see it now. It's still Bitcoin is um, a speculative asset. Uh, 
-hmm. People want to do operations and trading, but some groups like um, Jerico Aquara, like Aria Bitcoin, we are starting a movement of um, how we, we can create a circular economy for people to use it as money to prevent this kind of censorship and the problems that fiat money has. I like to, to talk about the previous money, uh, the currencies like Jurassic fiats. They are, Jurassic. All, yeah, okay. they are already extincted and some will be extincted as well. Okay, next. amazing. Ernesto, why don't we get a little bit of background about El Salvador? Well, lately I've been asked the same question, a lot of things about Bitcoin, as you yeah. may imagine. But to understand our context, we're coming from a, from a civil war in 92 that ended, but our local currency, the Colón, had lost a lot of its value. So the purpose of the government in those days was to create a new paradis fis fiscal, mm -hmm. like Panama. Okay. And well, that didn't work out very well, but we ended with the American dollar. What happened with American dollars? Two, two big problems about American dollars. First of all, the government spends a lot of money to buy new, new currency. And also, a hundred million of dollars are lost in fees for Western Union and other companies because half of the income of the country comes from remittance. So maybe two, three years ago, when, the, when this problem was noticed by the government, they, they were trying to look for answers to solutions. Mm -hmm. And they noticed a project in the beach, as you may know, that was working very well for poor people. And there was another element. Eight out of 10 Salvadorans don't have a bank account. They don't exist in the banking system. So it was, a really, it was really challenging for them to buy a house, to buy things at the grocery, groceries and everything, because they, they weren't part of, the, of that system. That's when the government created this new policy and they implemented the Bitcoin as local currency. And it's, it's, been really, it's been really fun for the past year because it's been a lot of try and error. Things are working well. Some other things have to improve. The fact that the wallet is, the main wallet is controlled by the government, it's an experiment. And as I, th as I say to my investments and my, cl my clients, th they want to try what's working, what's not working, it must be improved. But it, it's, been really, it's been really fun to see people with no bank, no banking knowledge, no banking education, using Bitcoin mm -hmm. on the streets, getting McDonald's but while paying with Bitcoin. So it's been maybe 20 years of currency experience, banking experience in El Salvador. And I think we're right now in, in this position that, that, makes interest, that makes us an experiment for the world. And that's 2020, 2022 for us. And, and I know this is obviously we're, we're very biased here, pro Bitcoin on the stage here. But <laughs> do, do you think that the El Salvador, you know, Bitcoin experiment, do you think it's had any downside so far in, in, in the context of, you know, inflation or censorship? Well, actually, a we all know people that have left the country to work in, the, in America to send money to their families in El Salvador. And w when you listen from them that they were paying about 5 to 10% on fees, mm -hmm. and now they're not paying that. They're sending that money, the whole, the whole amount, to their families in El Salvador, and you see people trying to invest. Invest in El Salvador was, wasn't, the, wasn't part of the SEO on Google. Now it is. Wow. So okay. just changing the fact that, that the word invest now exists, it's, it's a lot of... The, it's a lot of it's a game-changing experience. Is that a fact? That's, that's amazing. It's a fact, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Just goes to show, right? Putting Bitcoin there has really put El Salvador on, on the world map as well. Um, I wanted to fly back to Brazil, if possible. As, um, Carol, as I understand it, your YouTube channel recently went Bitcoin maxi. Yeah. As previously, you were like a crypto YouTuber. Now you're, woo, yeah, round of applause. <laughs> um, was it because of these properties, you know, the, the fact that Bitcoin is censorship resistant and it's deflationary as opposed to inflationary? Did that somewhat um, influence your, uh, your decision there? Totally. Um, I think that uh, our changing was the normal path of a lot of people. And the nice thing I could, is that it was public, but it was the same process. We discovered the space, started uh, Big, accepting a lot of uh, 
philosophies inside. But when you start to deep uh, dive into Bitcoin, you start to understand money, how networks uh, work, how you can have a really decentralized uh, system, monetary system. And there's, I don't know when these moments happen, but it happens. You understand that it's the only thing that can change the world and, and can change money and, and can bring decentralization is Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And when you see it, you don't want anything else. You want to just show this to people. And it became like a, a, a reason to produce content, to educate, and that's why we changed, because we understood it. And we already were a Bitcoin only and Bitcoin first like one year ago, but changing the name would uh, make it more clear for our public to don't have any misunderstood about it. So that's why we changed. We're really, really happy. And it's kind of a relief to show this. We're Bitcoiners. Nice, nice, great. Um, I've got a little anecdote here to share because when I was living and working in the Ivory Coast or Côte d'Ivoire, um, uh, it's actually where I was sort of orange-pilled. My driver at the time, a guy called Guillaume, he used to receive Bitcoin from Paris. And I was like, I was working for Bloomberg at the time, and I was like, Guillaume, why are you using this Ponzi scheme? Like, <laughs> like you know, we all know it's a scam. And he told me, oh, because so, I can't get access to a bank. And I was like, oh, wow, this is, this is new to me. I thought everyone could just have a bank. And the reason why I'm sharing this story is because I want to know if the uh, banking system, if it's targeted in its victimization of people around the world, or if it's just one of those things where the system is a little bit, you know, broken and uh, struggles to... Yeah, it's, it's not a, a targeted thing. I don't know if anyone wants to jump in there. And I mean, it depends on uh, the particular case. Like in, in my instance, when I'm talking about what happened this year in Canada, it was very much targeted. It was, yeah. it was hey, we are the government. Um, we've deemed, uh, again, again, the largest protest in Canadian history. And the, the narrative that was put out was that these people are other than these people are a fringe minority of people with unacceptable views. These, I'm verbatim quoting my prime minister right now. And um, they, they would take a reel of, of one idiot flying a, 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 an insensitive flag and, uh, and that's all that you saw on the news coverage. And they used that as, as like a, a, a launch board to be able to um, say, this is why we're shutting down all these people's bank accounts. And sadly, it, it, for a, a narrative kind of being spun, it worked. Because I'd say 70% of the public was cheering on those actions, was saying, yes, shut down those bank accounts. Those people are horrible. Because um, a, a lot of people are fam unfamiliar, but like our, our media in Canada is is directly subsidized by the government. The CBC is subsidized by the government. They get billions of dollars every single year. Um, so it, it helps uh, when, when you have a specific message you want to get out and you're the ones bankrolling, the ones in charge of uh, taking that message to the people. So yes, it was very targeted, but you know, there's instances where stuff just doesn't work. Everybody has those experiences, but I mean, you guys in particular have, have experienced much more of that than, than myself. Again, I'm, I'm in a pretty privileged position when I agree with what the government's doing. <laughs> <laughs> key point, key asterisk there. Yeah. <laughs> in Brazil, uh, a lot of banks shut down the exchange's bank accounts as well, just simply by negotiating Bitcoin. And peer to peer, uh, uh, people that negotiated peer to peer had their bank accounts closed. But right now, Brazil is one of the countries that have it, Bitcoin ETF, a lot of banks offering Bitcoin. Now they are competing. It is, they, they are not uh, closing their accounts, mm -hmm. unless there's something, I don't know, scams around something like that. There, there's a lot in Brazil. But uh, in the beginning, they were fighting, closing bank accounts of uh, Bitcoin peer-to-peer. This was a direct uh, target. Mm, okay. okay. Ernesto? You know, in El Salvador, banks and all the companies there had seven days to implement Bitcoin. <laughs> and they did. <laughs> and they did since day one. So it was really a rush development, mm -hmm. but it really worked well. The first day, 
Of course, there, was, there were a lot of people trying to play with those phones and everything, but McDonald's had already set that up. Supermarkets to pharmacies, and they had seven days. So when you, have, when you don't have the choice, you just do it. <laughs> and, and it really worked well because, and I will say that, there's a lot of technicians, there's a lot of developers, there's a lot of people that know how to do it, easier and very fast, and they just did. <laughs> so by inference here, the heads of states around the world just need to give the order, and uh, we've got worldwide adoption, right? It's a vision. Okay, great. You have to have the vision. <laughs> um, so at the start, I asked about the, the rates of inflation. We had double digit over here, and I guess, Ernesto, your inflation rate is technically, what, 3% because of the Bitcoin issuance rate? Is that fair to say? <laughs> <laughs> but, but you know that the central bank right now have two inflation rates mm -hmm. on Bitcoin, on US dollars. That's so weird. Yeah, okay. they, ha they have to implement that. It's the cohabitation. Okay, <laughs> got it. And yes, you have two digits in the US dollars and you have 3% on Bitcoin. I know which I'd rather. <laughs> um, but, uh, but in this inflationary environment that we're seeing all around the world, um, Bitcoin adoption is still lagging a little bit and the price, of course, is way down in the, I don't know what it is, but 20-ish K. Um, why is that? And uh, surely it should be flying right now. Surely we should be doing this in... I don't know, on a, on a yacht somewhere. <laughs> I mean... No offense, by the way, this is great. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is kind of the same old story that we've, we've always seen, right? Um, you stick around long enough and you're, you're sitting through these bear markets going, oh my God, look at, look at all these incredible things being built. Because this, this is the time when stuff is being built because you're not distracted by staring at a price sticker all day. Um, and so when everybody's got their heads down and they're building stuff and you know you get together like this, you get to talk about it, but the world at large, nobody, like out, outside of people that have already been here, there's not a lot of new people that are watching stuff like this and understanding how much innovation is actually happening. Um, it's in those bull markets that you, you kind of, I guess, you get the price that you deserve from what was built during the bear market, I suppose, and maybe sometimes you overshoot. I'd argue we undershot this time. Mm -hmm. uh, but but I, I think, again, you see the fruits of labor of your labor later on. And so everybody in 2017 that was saying, oh, Bitcoin's never gonna scale. I mean, I've got, uh, I, my podcast, people pay per minute with microtransactions, fractions of a penny. Shout out to Fountain. Yes, shout out to Fountain. Um, and, and so I can see microtransactions coming into my lightning node uh, from here that is running back in Canada. And, and by all accounts of everybody in 2017, that should not be possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we, we see what appears on the outside looking in to be these, these bursts of innovation, but it's actually hard work through these downturns where everybody's actually, again, heads to the ground, they're, they're working and building out systems. Um, and, and to everybody else, a few years from now, you'll see the headlines again, oh my God, Bitcoin's back. We thought it died again and again and again. And it's always gonna be a surprise unless people stick around and they see what happens when the whole world isn't currently watching. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I think this, uh, this moment is really peculiar because in 2019 or 18, uh, the price was low, there was little interest, but now I see uh, news about Bitcoin acceptance, new places accepting Lightning as well. So I think that at each cycle, more people will get interested not just by the number go up, but for the, uh, what Bitcoin solves is money, is uh, how to have a better life, is an asset, or you can have more freedom. Uh, all of these aspects are Bitcoin, and in the bear market, they get stronger and stronger because that's when Bitcoin is attacked for energy, for uh, all the things, the food that we hear, and I think this is a time when we concentrate the strength for build, for creating new kind of um, uh, models to explain the Bitcoin movements. So I think this is natural, like to breathe. You expand 
and you exhale. So I guess it's like a Bitcoin meditation. We need to exhale. We need to ex extirpate the, the food and the bad things that people create during the bull cycle. I love this way of framing a bear market. You know, this is the Zen time. We're all exhaling. Yeah. Okay. Just okay. let it pass. <laughs> well, value varies. Value is never fixed. And if value is fixed, there's a problem. Fluctuation is just a normal and regular thing in every single thing in the world. That's why we have summer, we have winter. Things need to move. And it all depends when you jump in the, in the wave. It's all about timing. When you buy a new house, you trust in your future. You trust in the fact that you will be working and making some money to pay for that house. And if you can, you, of course you can ask, why if, why if, what if, what if? Yeah, but there's a lot of what if in the world. And that, that's the fact of living. When you live and you jump in the right wave in the right time, now when the wave is big and you have it in 10 meters from you, it's evident. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that will happen in a few, <laughs> in a few months, a years. We don't know. And it would be really boring if we already knew when it was going to happen. There's no fun of knowing. There's fun in playing the game. It's in the long run. Okay, okay. Um, I want to flip this question on its head a bit. And I want to work out if Bitcoin victimizes or discriminates. You know, are there any ways in which the currency could be perceived to be you know, a, a tool for, not exactly censorship, but you know, it cuts people out? So, I'm going to refer to a quote from a guy I really like, um, and by the way, his book has been translated to French and it's sitting out oh, in, in uh, no, actually, uh, oh. another uh, a Canadian named Jeff Booth. Oh. And, um, and he was actually, he visited El Salvador and he spoke to a lot of Bitcoin critics and he was asked you know, after explaining it to some of the critics, and they kind of started to turn around and say, okay, well, we see how this could be useful, um, but tell us what's the worst thing about Bitcoin? And so he thought for a moment, and then he ended up something along the lines of, the worst thing about Bitcoin is that um, you have to be okay with the fact that not only can your enemies use it, but your enemies using it makes it stronger and better for you. It's a lot of, that's a pretty difficult thing for every, everyone to parse that somebody that I hate can use Bitcoin and it makes it better for me. That's, but that's the reality of the system. The more people use it. And, and so the, the world's going to have to deal with this. I was, I was at um, the Oslo Freedom Forum in, in Norway recently with Alex Gladstein and the, I, I got talking with uh, some of the organizers because they they kind of had two different lines of thought in and around Bitcoin um, that that don't quite parse. They're promoting Bitcoin as a humanitarian tool, which absolutely can be used for. But they also had a track on ESG and how you can divest from assets that you hold that may be enriching uh, world leaders that you don't like. Those things don't line up because if they're promoting Bitcoin as a humanitarian tool and some dictator that does bad things uses it later on, how do you parse those two ideas of we're going to divest from things that can be used for bad, but we're going to use Bitcoin. The second somebody bad uses it, that, that no longer lines up. So again, um, can, can Bitcoin be used for, for, for bad things? Absolutely. Any useful value system that allows people to transact will be used by and whoever sets these definitions good and or bad people mm. yeah it makes you wonder you know what would happen if north korea were to announce we're adopting bitcoin as legal tender tomorrow you know would that be the end for bitcoin <laughs> Sorry. so i don't think uh, uh, bitcoin discriminates what i believe is that um we are impregnant with a fiat mindset. It's hard to let it go. Like um, how money works, how it, it reflects in our daily lives, our choices. 
how to go to the market, which product we will buy, the cheapest or the best, with the best properties. When you start to understand Bitcoin, you start to reflect about all your choices in life. What do you believe in life? But the current uh, mindset, uh, the fiat mindset, it brought people to the short-term mindset. Everything is quick, everything is for tomorrow, you can't wait for things to get value to grow. And this changed our heads through 100 years. When governments can manipulate the money, they manipulate the mindset. So for me, um, fiat discriminates. Bitcoin don't discriminate. Anybody can access this, uh, this network through an app. But it's hard to understand. It's hard to invert your mindset. And this is the big challenge for us, for educators, to help people to see what Bitcoin is, how, you, how you can achieve it, how you can use it, how you can uh, survive with Bitcoin in an uh, inflationary environment. So um, this is not a discrimination, but this is a challenge for us. And this is the biggest difficulty also in Brazil. Even through inflation, people still uh, uh, are more trustful in fiat and in banking accounts and uh, economist, Canadian economist, you know? Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to add one other thing in terms of things that, in, in what you're saying, a fiat mindset could be construed as a negative. Bitcoin is a, a cruel but effective teacher. And what I mean by that is when you make a mistake, there's no undo button. So if you, you know, we've been babysat for so long by the fiat system. And that gives us this sense of comfort. You know, whatever I do wrong, whatever, it'll, it'll be fine. I'll get reimbursed. You know why you can get reimbursed, right? Because there's no money printer go burr. They can just, if it, the, when the mistakes pile up too much, they can bail out the entity that holds your money. But the cost of that is the deprecation of your purchasing power over time. Um, and everything that, that decays society that comes along with it. Bitcoin does not have that, that backstop, and because of it, it necessitates personal responsibility. Um, and that's something that people are going to have to come to terms with. Um, if, if you want a, a money that actually maintains its purchasing power over time, that, that allows you to store the fruits of your labor indefinitely, and in a, a naturally deflationary world where technology allows us to create more with the same amount of effort or less, if you want something that's reflective of that and brings about a world like that, then you also have to accept the personal responsibility that comes along with that. Because if you do not, we're doomed to continue this cycle of, of this fiat mentality where, well, we've got, we got a, a, a bailout back up, ready to go, um, and we'll just extract that wealth from everyone else. Just off the back of that, I just wanted to get a show of hands in here. Has anyone done anything with Bitcoin where they've been like, oh no, I've sent it to the wrong address or you know, I've made a mistake? Just, yeah, I was going to say I have. <laughs> okay, and there, there's some people in here that have been in Bitcoin for a long time. So, you know, it's, it's normal and common and watch Ben's videos to not make those mistakes. <laughs> from the people of my country experience, I can say that the real challenge is technology. Not everybody has the access to a cell phone, to internet, to a great network connection. And maybe it's not a discrimination from Bitcoin, being discriminated from Bitcoin, with Bitcoin, but from telecommunications, which is completely different. And I think that that's the challenge for, for developing countries like El Salvador, a lot of cities in Brazil and many, many countries, because People want, they want to learn, but they don't know about how to use tools. And if you grab a knife in the opposite side, you will cut your hand. You have to learn how to use a knife to, to defend yourself. So it's exactly what happened with Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just to follow up to that as well. I mean, what happens if you're in a country where you grow up and you're illiterate or you don't have access to a, to a mobile phone? You know, does that not mean that you're automatically discriminated from using Bitcoin? You know, cash you can use, right? Because you can recognize the symbols. I'm generally curious to see if anyone has a, um, a sort of an answer for that. 
I mean, that precludes them from using a banking application as well, right? True, yeah. <laughs> but so, you know, you're, you're pretty much... In this hyper-Bitcoinized world where there are no banks, you know, how are these people going to, to use uh, Bitcoin? Example would be perhaps, uh, I mean, you can already get tap cards, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, being illiterate is, is definitely a, a major you know, roadblock in the way of, of dealing with society as a whole, right? So, um, you know, do people then create solutions and applications that are, are uh, you know, they have applications for people that are blind. Mm -hmm. um, so will the market create solutions for, for maybe somebody who's illiterate? And that's perhaps. I think so, yeah. I think, you know, emojis as well, that sort mm -hmm. of thing. Like WhatsApp's penetration around the world was very low, you know, three or four years ago. And then suddenly voice notes became a thing, emojis became a thing, GIFs became a thing. And suddenly people that can't read or write are able to interact with people around the world without realizing that they're, you know, technically typing. Yeah, I think a great example is in Africa. They are creating a system where you can send Bitcoin through an SMS. So yeah. this is a way you don't have to have a smartphone, but a cell phone, it's more common. A cheap cell phone so you can exchange bitcoin like a message so this is a good way to um, scale in developing countries and uh, where people don't have access to smartphones and apps and uh, lightning apps for example but through other technologies like telecommunications they can exchange bitcoin maybe this is a, a way it will uh, scale yeah yeah i'm really excited about machankura the south african yeah, yeah. it's a great startup uh, Basically, you can send Bitcoin like a text. So those that previously didn't have internet connections would now be able to transact with Bitcoin. Um, so again, it's these sort of tools for empowerment and inclusivity. Um, what would you do if um, tomorrow you wake up in Canada and Trudeau says Bitcoin's banned? Or you, know, you wake up tomorrow and Bolsonaro is like, oh, we're not having Bitcoin here. I guess, Ernesto, this question doesn't really apply to you. <laughs> that wouldn't happen <laughs> anytime soon. So I don't live right next to a body of water, but I probably immediately go boating. Um, <laughs> Good. <laughs> see about that. Um, yeah, I mean, that's, that's a, a, a tough question. Obviously, I'm a tad screwed because yes, I'm, you I'm pretty public. Uh, but that's when you start... I mean, I'm already kind of a little bit in the back of my head, shopping jurisdictions, looking at secondary passports. I think that's... Um, something a lot of Bitcoiners lean towards looking at the idea of various jurisdictions where it's this, uh, those that haven't read The Sovereign Individual, um, it's an excellent book worth looking into, but there's a thesis that um, over time with the advent of the internet and then eventually digital money um, that people become sovereign individuals where you, you effectively shop your jurisdiction um, and uh, jurisdictions are forced to, rather than treat the constituents as employees, treat them as customers and advertise, what am I getting for my tax money? And draw people in. And I think with the advent, again, of Bitcoin, that can and will be something that we see come to pass over the coming decades. So I guess my answer is immediately, I, I, don't, I don't know, um, but then... Uh, you, you start looking for places that are most friendly and, and you become that sovereign individual. See you in El Salvador. I agree with Ben. I will be neighbor to yeah. Ernesto. <laughs> I would move to El Salvador. I, um, there's a phrase, I think that it's from the sovereign individual, that's like, vote with your feet. Mm -hmm. Go where it tr uh, treats you the best. So I would be really angry and I would say, I will no longer live here because they don't approve this philosophy. They will keep uh, extracting the value from the population. I don't want to keep here. I would go to live in El Salvador maybe or other places that are friendly as well. It may sound funny, but I have a few clients who just bought their homes in El Salvador just in case. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay. Just in case. And it's happening. Yeah, it goes to show, right? Okay. And um, just, we're coming to the last five minutes now. I wanted to look at the, we've looked at the victims of the banking system around the world. Um, who are the beneficiaries of the, the banking system around the world? You know, who benefits from this inflation and this censorship? The continuers, I guess. This and, is who's, the... and who's that? 
Yeah, they are the ones because they are the best friends of the central banks. They um, uh, have maybe private information. They can benefit uh, uh, staking assets uh, that most of the population don't have access. So they benefit from the printing uh, that the government uh, does. And for me, they are the ones that most benefit from this uh, fiat system. Yeah, I, I was just going to say, again, there's, there's a, a bit of a misconception, especially in, in the past couple of years where, uh, you know, a lot of Americans and people in, in various countries, I'm not sure exactly how it played out in Europe, but a lot of people got checks and they, and they felt, you know, the, the, that mindset of, oh, the, the number in my bank account went up because of this. Um, but that's not the important number. So if you were to... Uh, kind of look at things from a high level. I mean, money in an economy is just representative of all the possible goods and services that a set group of people can create and offer. And so what you should be looking at is your percentage of that economy that you can afford. And if all of your bank accounts showed a percentage, that number would perpetually be moving down even as you're getting those checks from the government because that's not the only money they're printing. They're printing much, much more, and they're allocating a small portion. They're giving out the scraps to people, and then they're allocating far larger amounts to where they see fit. And the, the amount of, of hubris in saying that we know better than the inputs of hundreds of millions of people and their individual uh, economic decisions, uh, we, we know better where that money should go and how to allocate capital um, is just beyond me. But uh, think about your percentage of purchasing power versus the number of dollars or euros in your bank account. It's, it's very cool, actually, the idea that you own a percentage of the total. And some, you know, like Casa, the app shows you like the percentage you own. So if I was Michael Saylor logging into Casa, it would show, you know, I own three and a half percent of all the bitcoins that we mined, yeah. um, which is, you know, kind of cool. Sorry, Ernesto. Exactly. That's my point. It's all about shareholders. Mm -hmm. So banks are a great, a huge industry. And there's a lot of shareholders in that business. So they are. <laughs> There's no uh, secret behind that. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, just before we close up for the questions here, is there a final message or something that you'd like to uh, really drive home with regards to the, the topic at hand, you know, banking system and inflation and censorship? I would say that Bitcoin is for everyone, everywhere, all the time. You don't, don't have to look at it when it's going up in price. You need to look in what Bitcoin is and how it changes the, how the world works. And I think uh, go deep into Bitcoin, not be just into the price. Go deep into the decentralization, how network uh, works, how it changes money, and that's the message. Nice. Um, I'll, I'll put a challenge out to everybody here. Um, if you've already learned about Bitcoin, you own some Bitcoin, you've taken uh, your own custody of said Bitcoin, um, and maybe put in cold storage, I would challenge you to now look at running a Bitcoin node. And the reason I say that is because this is what actually gives you um, the power to, to not be screwed by the banking system because you are now uh, a, an actual runner of the network. And what that allows you to do is you're running an entire copy of every transaction that's ever happened, but you're also running the rules that govern the network. And you could kind of think of it like voting for a political party, and it doesn't matter who wins, because you get to go by the rules of the person you voted for no matter what. And nobody can force you to change the code that you are running. So if you have not, um, you don't need to research a ton to do this. You just, the node itself is the learning tool. So start. Um, run a node, you can download Bitcoin Core and you can uh, link that up to a wallet like Sparrow. I'm going to be doing a workshop tomorrow at 11 on Sparrow if you want to learn multisig. Um, but another easy option where the user interface is very simple and user friendly for uh, those that are hesitant, check out something called Umbrel, U-M-B-R-E-L, and you can run that on a, a tiny little computer in your house. And uh, it's really cool. It's a great tool to learn about how Bitcoin itself works. Run nodes, guys. Yeah. I think there's a lot of things happening in the world. Every single day happens new things. And I really think it's important to be curious. 
being an early ad adopter is important. And being curious to learn what's behind the new innovations is, is, is really important. Mm -hmm. Because you're living in this, day, in this time. You're living in 2022. And if you learn what's happening right now, 10 years from now, it's going to be late. Mm -hmm. And life's short. <laughs> That it is. Wow, you finished literally on zero there. <laughs> Ernesto, <laughs> round of applause Life for that. Life's <laughs> um, Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Ernesto, Carol, and Ben. Um, excellent panel, guys. And uh, if we have any questions, I'd like to open up to the floor. Yeah, Ricky. Oh, sorry, is that not my job? Thank you, guys. I have a question for Ernesto. Ernesto, I'm really following closely what you guys are doing in El Salvador. It's historical. And you said something very important. I agree with you. Remittances are what's going to drive the adoption in emerging markets. Uh, according to a report from the central banking of El Salvador reported on the newspaper, in the past year, $3 billion have been sent from people, Salvadorian, living and working abroad to El Salvador. But according to the same report, only 52 millions were sent using the Chivo, via Chivo app. That makes less than 2%. Can you confirm those data? And if that is true, what am I missing? What is not working yet? Why Salvadorian are not jumping on this great opportunity yet? That's a great and a very deep question from you. <laughs> and it's money, politics, and society. The main issue in El Salvador when, when Bitcoin arrived was that it was implemented by a government. And as, as you were talking about that, people choose a government, but there's a lot of people that don't like the government in place. I think it's very relative to judge a government by the look the president in what he's wearing, what, what's the way he speaks. But the way that Bitcoin was implemented in El Salvador, it was very political. So there was a huge amount of the population that didn't want to use the wallet created by the government. And there's also a second reason that the wallet that the government created, it was so, it was created that so fast that it, it, it wasn't reliable. So of course, when Bitcoin was la launched, we all were using and trying the app and it was really sad that at, at that time, Chivo Wallet wasn't working very well. So all my friends, the people that were using Bitcoin on Strike Moon and every other wallet, and it was working. So what happened in one week? For seven days, business were showing like, we don't accept Chivo Wallet. We, we don't, please don't use Chivo Wallet. And then the government tried to fix the wallet. It started w working a little bit better. And in those days, there, there was a lot of tourists in El Salvador trying to pay with Bitcoin. There was even Jonathan, Joss, and from a second set. And they were having fun about that. Because it was like, okay, what's not working well? People won't trust a wallet if you don't get to send and receive the money. And I remember we were at the restaurant, and they tried to pay with li Lightning, and the restaurant was receiving with Chivo. And we had to wait for two hours because the money was getting there. So there was a lot of technical problems linked to the wallet created by the government that made it hard to people to understand how to use it. I, I cannot confirm the, the right amount of, of remittance sent by with Chivo Wallet, but I can say that people, they are curious about not paying the fees they pay with Western Union and other companies. And the amount of money being received in El Salvador in Bitcoin is it's, it's growing a lot. I, I told my family about that. It's, it's really fun because we were expecting people that receive remittance to be using more Bitcoin. But actually, it's investors that are coming more to buy homes, create, build new homes. And the real challenge has been to how to get the fiat from the Bitcoin sent by investors. So the government maybe give a step back to the remittance purpose of the Bitcoin implementation in Salvador. And they noticed that it was investment that was taking the, the place. So I think for the past six, eight months, they've been trying to learn and understand how to use Bitcoin in El Salvador. 
because remittance it would may, maybe take three, five, seven years, because people that they're working in, in a, well, let's be clear, Salvadorans that leave El Salvador and go to work to America, they build houses, they clean toilets, they, they're in those areas, so they won't trust an app that sends money somehow in electricity. So they, they will have to pass a lot of months and years to them to trust. Because Western Union, you have it every single corner. It's expensive, it's slow, it's tedious, but they know it works. So it will take a year, maybe, to understand that, hey, it's exactly the same, and I don't lose time, and I don't pay the fee. So it's, it's a social, social implementation that it will take more time to be done. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, it's, it's unlearning those habits, aren't they? And those habits are so ingrained. Social habit, yeah. yeah. And they're not as fast as technological implementation. Mm. Yeah. Creating an app is a lot faster than making people understand how to use it and how, mm. how you can benefit from it. Mm. Very good. Here in France, the narrative is uh, Bitcoin is bad, but blockchain is awesome, Web3 is the future, and Metaverse is uh, what we need to invest in. Uh, what is the narrative in your respective country? I miss that. Um, Web3 crypto stuff versus Bitcoin in your countries. Is, is, sorry. <laughs> Shit coins in uh, your countries. What's going on with it in my countries? Like what's the, the, the narrative. Oh, uh, depends where you are. Uh, if you go to Toronto, you'll see a lot of that stuff. Um, so, so Toronto's blockchain, not Bitcoin. Um, there's there's some Bitcoiners there. Greg Foss is there. Uh, there's some good yeah. There's some good Bitcoiners over there. Um, there's been a good shift in Vancouver. Um, there's some incredible Bitcoin-only meetups that have been uh, springing up, and they've had just an amazing speakers. Um, is, so is that the I, Jeff Booth effect? Of yeah, Vancouver. Jeff Booth was just there. Greg Foss was there. Samson Mao, I believe, is going to be there pretty soon. There's there's a lot of different speakers that are, they're having in, but the turnout has been incredible. So I've got to give a shout-out to Fussler. Uh, is his name. Uh, but he organizes the Vancouver meetups, and he's doing an awesome job for Bitcoin uh, BTC ban. Uh, so... Yeah, um, but you know, there's it, just like everywhere. I think uh, it takes a little bit of time for people to come to it. Same, same as everybody's journey. It's it's not a um, closed-minded thing to come to Bitcoin only. It's actually a a thoroughly thought through position where most Bitcoin only people started dabbling in everything, and then they laid laid out why am I here and what do I think it's is necessary to achieve those goals. And when you start trying to tick boxes, everything you come across leaves a few of those boxes blank and you're left with Bitcoin. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, complementing, I would think that when you perceive that, uh, when you notice that crypto is fiat, you change. You change to Bitcoin only. In Brazil, uh, the narrative is totally shitcoin and blockchain, Web3. And that's mainly because of ex exchanges and venture capitals uh, putting money in, in those um, companies. But it's changing. Uh, after we became uh, Bitcoin only, the movement of Bitcoiners, uh, we have so much support and it was great. And there's a lot of projects growing like Vintium, that it's a project about open source education for devs in Brazil, Bitcoin only. So I think this is a movement that is growing uh, the more people awake to Bitcoin and what it is. And when they uh, notice that crypto is fiat, they change. That, that was the change that happened, happened with us. And a lot of uh, Brazilians that follow, follow us uh, notice that crypto is fiat and are changing too. I think that uh, showing the difference is important for people to do the transaction. So I think that's, that's the way. I just have one last thought if I can. <laughs> Um, just because you brought up crypto as fiat, I think a good way to think of it, and I, I forgive me, I forget who originally said this, but um, fiat, like government fiat, is government can print money. Crypto is everyone can print money. Bitcoin is no one can print money. I don't want to repeat what you just said, but... Of course, we've heard a lot of new coins and everything happening. <laughs> and every single week, there's a new event of somebody creating a new money. Yeah. 
And it's just not working because people, they, they're really afraid of putting their money somewhere th where they don't know what, what's going to happen. And not knowing what's going to happen is, is what makes them afraid and is what's keeping them away from other, other crypto. And it's what you said. People that may be, they're very conscious about the fact that with Bitcoin you cannot create the money. You are not able to do that, as the government can. Print more money, and get more paper and ink, and just do it. So, at least in El Salvador, even if there's a lot of crypto, new crypto appearing every single week, they're not buying it. <laughs> awesome. Wicked. Well, thank you. another round of applause, please, for the amazing panel to my left, Ben, Carol, and Ernesto. And um, yeah, in, in the UK, we also have a lot of shit coinery. Um, but through this cycle, we've actually seen a lot of the prominent UK Bitcoiners, UK shit coiners become Bitcoiners. Um, so yeah, I think it's similar in most developed countries around the world, unfortunately. Um, voila. Awesome. Cool. Thanks. And thanks for taking starts for hosting us. Yes. <laughs>